The Earth was once the center of the universe. It was flat. Then it was round. And it circled the sun. It was no longer the center of the universe. It was a tiny part of the Milky Way. The Milky Way was the only galaxy, except it wasn't. It was only one of billions of galaxies floating in space without end. Every single time we think we've got it all figured out, we realize we've merely found another piece of the picture. It is a big picture. With many pieces. Sir Isaac Newton was the first to state the law of gravity. Eventually, everybody agreed that gravity alone formed galaxies and stars and planets, and that gravity alone holds the universe together. Then we discovered a force a thousand billion, 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 billion times more powerful than gravity. Until recently, we believed that the space between the stars and planets was empty, a vacuum. We now know it is teeming with charged particles. We see glowing electric filaments spanning millions of light years. We see stellar and galactic formations shaped by magnetic fields. Only electric currents create magnetic fields. It is possible that the predominant force in the universe is not gravity, but something else. The rise of science was a triumph over mythology, over magic and superstition. That's why the word science today implies reliability. The word myth means fiction, not true. And it turns out that the key to understanding the myths is the same key that is now helping us to understand objects in deep space. Understand the workings of the physical universe. That key is electricity. It was 33 years ago that I first began to wonder about these preposterous stories told around the world, what we call world mythology. What was it that provoked this incredible outpouring of human imagination just a few thousand years ago, just before the birth of the first civilizations? I came to a radical conclusion that the myths arose from extraordinary natural events. Our early ancestors witnessed things in the sky that are not seen today. The events were awe-inspiring, 
both beautiful and terrifying. So it shouldn't surprise us that the myths are so incomprehensible. Well, of course they're incomprehensible. The, the celestial references are no longer present. It was in 1994 that I was invited to come to the US to attend a conference which was dealing with the possibility that the ancient sky, as witnessed by our earliest forebears, was different to the one we see today. I'd been interested in this uh, kind of idea because uh, it could only be explained in terms of electromagnetic influences within the solar system. So it came as a bit of a shock and a surprise to see David Talbot showing slides at one of the uh, sessions at the conference which I recognized immediately as being similar to those of electric discharges in the laboratory. It was wonderful for me personally to uh, come to my first Cronia meeting and hear Dave Talbot and I still want to see some of those slides that he showed again and again and again that explained the, the white crown of Egypt and the rest of these uh, things that he showed us, all from mythology, all from thousands of years ago. These things clearly were seen by civilizations that never talked to each other from the far corners of the earth. It all just clicked together like a, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle in my mind. A breakthrough for me came when I realized that many different cultures spread around the world use different words, different symbols, different myths to describe precisely the same formations in the sky. The Ouroboros, our celestial serpent biting its tail, for example, occurs on every habitable continent, but it has no ties to the world we now observe. Like all of the archetypes, it is part of an alien sky. cosmic column rising to the center of the sky, holding aloft the wheel of heaven. And much more than a wheel, because this was the revolving cosmic temple, the city of the gods, the kingdom of heaven, always resting on the cosmic column. Then there's the image of the four rivers or pathways radiating from the center of the sky out to the boundary, the rim of the wheel. The simplest forms lead you invariably to the full story of world mythology. The hero's journey unfolds as the story of the wheel's axle. The mother goddess finds her identity in the star at the summit, the hub and spokes of the wheel. From childhood on, I've always had uh, a deep interest in mytholo mythology, and I remember that as a child I was trying to draw up uh, genealogies of the gods as provided in Greek mythology, and I, I soon found out that it didn't work, nor did anything else in mythology seem to work. There was no singular fitting explanation that would make sense of these stories. So I basically laid this whole subject to rest, and I didn't look at it for many years, until I came across the work um, by Dave Talbot and, uh, and Everett Cochran mainly, whose, whose articles were real eye-openers for me. And as soon as I began to read these articles, it became clear to me that we were really looking here at a very important key to the unlocking of myth. And the, the recent findings uh, provided by plasma physics are capable of providing that key. Um, based on the results we have seen so far in Dr. Perret's investigations um, with petroglyphs, which he matched successfully to laboratory experiments involving plasma, it has now become crystal clear and I think undeniable that um, the, the morphology of plasma as, as it manifests itself both in the laboratory and in space can account successfully for the major themes in, in, in mythology. To find the true meaning of the myths, we follow a forensic approach. The purpose is to expose the points of agreement between the different cultures. Because here at the level of the archetypes, everything is unified. There are no isolated themes of myth at the level of the substructure. This is like a holograph. Follow one archetype and its links to other archetypes. 
and you will find one story told around the world. Throughout almost all of history, we have regarded the states of matter as being solid, liquid or gas. But in the last century or so, we have found that there is a form of matter where the charged particles within atoms are separated to some degree or another, and that is known as a plasma. It is the fundamental state of matter. It was not until the second half of the 20th century that we came to realize the role of plasma in the universe. And this has changed the picture of space completely. Not long ago, we thought of the physical universe as being constituted fundamentally of nothing more than atoms and empty space. But a plasma includes at least a percentage of charged particles, protons and electrons, that are not bound to any atomic structure. And plasma is an excellent conductor. Electrons will move efficiently in the direction of charge equalization, and that's an electric current, of course. Now, the reason why we see magnetic fields everywhere we look in space is because electric currents produce magnetic fields, and only electric currents produce magnetic fields. But astronomers working only with gravitational equations did not anticipate the discovery of pervasive magnetic fields in deep space. Electric currents also account for the abundant filamentation of space plasma. First, the electric currents produce the magnetic fields. Then these fields confine the electron flow to narrow paths. Such current paths, or filaments, are called Birkeland currents, named after the pioneer Christian Birkeland. They are typically braided just like the twisted wires of transmission lines on Earth. Well, that's their role in space, to conduct electricity across vast distances, creating the astonishing structures we observe in every direction. None of these structures were anticipated by gravitational theory. And none are indicated by the behavior of neutral gases in a vacuum. In any theory of the universe, plasma is extremely important because it has been found since the space age that it makes up 99.99% of the visible universe. So our inexperience with it on the Earth's surface is rather uh, crippling when it comes to trying to decide on a cosmology to explain the visible universe. Now plasma behaves uh, rather oddly compared to uh, normal matter, the matter we find, the solids, liquids and gases on Earth. If you look at a novelty uh, plasma ball, you will see that it forms these bright filaments that dart all around inside the globe. And if you look closely at them, you'll see that they're actually twin filaments twisted together. In other words, nature finds it efficient to be able to transfer energy over a distance by twisting two pairs of filaments together. And this is a characteristic of the way plasma carries electric currents in space. And one of the puzzles that has faced astronomers since the space age is the discovery of filamentary uh, structures in galaxies, around stars, even the cometary tails of uh, planets and comets themselves. These filamentary structures have come as a surprise. <laughs> 